Let's do it. Cool. We Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whenever it is, you are catching some brainwaves. The podcast aimed at making us all more informed, inspired, and connected educators. I'm Ben Kolb, and joined as always by Becky Peters, but this episode is recorded in a completely undisclosed location deep in our homes. We are guarding the coordinates to this location because if our kids found out where we were hiding for an hour, we'd never do this show again. Uh, as we, yeah, yeah. And I think Becky, your kids found it, didn't they? Yeah. My, mine found me already. Uh, so I, I guess I don't have deep recesses in my house where I can hide from them, but they promise to be quiet. So we'll see how it goes. All right. Awesome. Well, as we are recording this episode, most of the world is under stay at home orders. Most students are learning totally online. Most teachers are teaching in 100% digital environments. And all of those are statements I never could have imagined saying, but it is our reality. So as Becky and I were looking for guests to have on the show to speak to that reality, we wanted experts who could tell us about truths that always will apply to teaching, but specifically apply to this unprecedented time in history. And it would be hard to find a better person or a better topic than who we have on this episode today. So we've got an amazing guest today, and our topic is all about listening well. Her name is Kate Murphy. She is a journalist for the New York Times and wrote a book about listening that seriously rocked my world. Um, I think it's the best book that I've read this year, and a lot of reviewers have called it the best nonfiction book of 2020. And you know when Adam Grant and Kim Scott rave about your book that you've written something awesome, and she certainly has. So as we think about skills that we can improve upon as, improve upon as teachers, um, this conversation will help us teach virtually, but also when we return to in-person learning and listening should always be at the very, very top of our list of skills to improve for ourselves. Yeah. I've always like wanted to be a better listener because I thought it made me like a better person, you know, but what I've realized in listening to this episode in reading her book is that being a good listener is being a good teacher and that the best teachers are the best listeners. And we do a great job in education of disguising normal things in like edu speak, right? And so we call it being a reflective practitioner or formatively assessing or checking for understanding. But all of those are just coded ways of saying that you listen and understand what your students get and what they don't get. And it's all about listening. Uh, In this episode, we talk about What do you lose on a WebEx or a Google Hangout video call? We talk about snatches of magic. We talk about why listening is essential to success and so much more. But without further ado, here she is. Let's start off with uh, who are you and why did you decide to write this book? Well, I'm a journalist based in Houston, Texas, and I decided, you know, I didn't decide to write this book. It's almost like the book came to me. You know, people kind of act like, you know, what was this aha moment? And it really wasn't one moment. I live in the same world as the, everybody else. So I was noticing, you know, going to dinners out and everyone sneaking glances at their phone or their phone being on the table and, you know, all the very loud restaurants where you can't hear one another. And then just being a journalist, I'm fascinated by listening. I mean, it's what I do for a living. And I really increasingly started to notice during interviews, people almost being shocked that I was actually listening as if it was a rare occurrence, that it was just, you know, something that, and and so appreciate it. And as a result, people often started to tell me incredibly personal, almost excruciatingly personal things while we were talking. And these were very accomplished people. And it made me wonder, you know, why are they choosing to tell me this? And after the interview, they would always say, thank me. Thank you so much for listening. Hmm. And with almost the same breath, they would say, I'm so sorry, you know, as if, as if they had done something wrong. And, you know, all of it just came together where I just felt like, you know, what is going on here? Why, why am I the person that they feel like I'm the only person that they can tell this to? And why do they feel ashamed of that? And why are they so grateful? And, you know, and it makes sense with everything I was just observing with our culture. You know, all you have to do is turn on the TV and hear people shouting at each other, nobody listening to one another. It's, you know, even the examples we have, you know, watch a congressional hearing, which is the most 
ineptly named thing because <laughs> no one's hearing anything. So it's really all of those pieces came together. And I've never found a subject that I, I never wanted to write a book. I, I love journalism. I never felt that there was a topic I couldn't cover in a newspaper article. But this one, no, I couldn't. Mm. It, it was something that deserved a book. In, in the intro of the book, you really talk about, like, in modern reality, we all have megaphones in our pockets and how we're all really kind of obsessed these days now with branding ourselves and kind of what we're putting out in the world rather than what we can get from the world. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the kind of listening that you're doing when people apologize to you and tell you really personal things and the kind of listening that we typically do every day? Well, I, I guess the difference is, is people aren't listening. You know, if they're always thinking in their head about, you know, what they're going to post later about the experience they're having at that moment, you know, they're not in the moment. They're not hearing what the person is saying. If they're always sort of preoccupied with what's going on in the virtual world, you know, what tweets they're missing, you know, what they need to check, they're not present. They're not listening. Their attention is divided. So, you know, that's what's really different. And, and also the, the difference is also that, you know, people are always, and, and it's not their fault. You know, I, I, this is not a finger wagging book. You know, people have been conditioned to be this way. They've been taught that they need to lead the conversation. They need to put themselves out there. They need to shape the narrative. They, you know, speak their truth. And so, you know, if that's the imperative, it's not sitting back and thinking, what can I learn about this other person? This person's got a story. I want to find out that person's story. It's a totally different mindset. And, you know, it's what allows you to listen, to just, you know, have that invitation, that welcome of letting the other person in and not trying. And again, it's, you know, I think it particularly you, you said before and was really good point of what's happening now is we are forced to realize even despite us really trying heretofore to think that we're in control and we are not in control. And, and the coronavirus pandemic is really showing us how we are not in control. And so there's something about in a conversation, you're always in control if you're the one who's talking or you feel like you are. And it is an element of giving up control when you decide you are going to listen to somebody because you don't know what you're going to hear. You don't know where it's going to go. But, you know, that's the grand adventure. And also, you know, that's why we're here to connect with one another. And so, you know, that's that's the difference is having that courage and also having that curiosity. Yeah, man, courage and curiosity to be a listener, right? Why do you think it, it takes courage and curiosity to be a good listener? Well, it takes, you know, courage, and like I said, because you don't know what you're going to hear. You know, you're giving up some degree of control because you're not commanding the narrative and saying where this is going to go. And then as far as curiosity is, you know, you, you got to want to know. I mean, everybody that's, you know, something I've learned as a journalist, a journalist is, you know, everybody's got a story and it's an interesting story if you allow them the time and the space to tell it. And so to be curious, knowing that it's in there, you know, to let it come out, to invite it out, ask questions and also, you know, kind of convey that sense of, I want to know. And when people feel like you want to know and you're really interested that you are curious, they'll tell you. They want to tell you. Like talk to you in a totally different way. I One of the, the parts that I really love is that if you are talking to someone and you find them to be boring or too controversial or, you know, somebody that you would not typically enjoy talking to, that that's just as much on you as it is on the person that you're talking to. How do you talk to boring people and let yourself still really hear their story. Do you know what I'm saying? Boring or people that disagree with you. Well, see, that's the thing is, you know, I don't find anyone boring, you know? <laughs> so and so awesome. I sort of struggle that with that because, you know, then you're making an assumption, you know, if you're mm -hmm. thinking somebody's boring, you know, you're actually going to make it that it make it. So you're going to make that happen. If that's person's, you know, because if that person perceives that you think they're boring, they're going to be boring. Yes. You know, it's going to shut them down. They're not going to they're not going to trust you. They're not going to tell you anything, you know, special within them or what makes them different. They're oh. not going to be vulnerable with you. You know, why would they? If you're acting like they're boring, 
And and also, I guess maybe, you know, I'm lucky in, you know, be, being a journalist that I have been put in so many situations with so many different people that I know nobody's boring. Yeah. You know, really, they aren't. And if you think they are, you know, you're setting yourself up. But, you know, it's really just you're the detective in the conversation. Yes. It's in there. And so you just need to follow the clues. And people will, you know, if you just listen, they'll give you the clues. And you can latch on to the clue and ask another question. And as far as, you know, people that disagree with me, I mean, I love that. I, you know, I, you know, and, and I guess part of it is, is that, you know, I don't, I, I'm always suspicious of people who have these really strong convictions and have this certainty that they're right. Mm -hmm. Because I, I don't feel that way. I just, you know, life is too complicated. Nothing is black and white. And I love to hear how people, you know, to know what people know that I may not know. And because they probably do, they have a different experience and they have a different way of looking at things. And even if I come on the other side, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure I buy that. You know, that's okay too, because then I understand that person better. I understand, you know, how they arrived at that. And it also consolidates within me. Well, you know, I don't agree with that because this, you can only be assured of your beliefs if they're challenged and not get upset about it, get curious about it. Why is that? Why do I feel that way? Why do you feel that way? I, I so wish more people had that disposition. I, I That whole chapter that you talk about in the book, I listened to it like five separate times because I wanted to make sure I absorbed all of it. And I'm sure I still didn't. But it, it seems in today's day and age when, you know, we are also kind of dug into our own opinions about things. And you're right, things are so complex, we can never be 100% right about anything. Um, but if, if we're just yelling at each other all the time, we're not going to get anywhere because we're not listening to each other. Um, and it's, it's I think it's so hard for people to keep open ears to people that have different political opinions or different religious opinions. Um, how do you encourage people to get past that to really listen to each other? Well, I think maybe going at it indirectly, because once you get to know the other person, it's really hard to hold on to your hostility, even if you you know disagree on certain points. I, I heard this really great interview a while back. Um, it was uh, during the impeachment hearings, um, and they brought in uh, Trent Lott and Tom Daschle, who were the minority and majority leader of the Senate during the Clinton impeachment. And they were asking, you know, why was it so much easier for you to set up, you know, rules of engagement, so to, so to speak, during the Clinton impeachment? Mm -hmm. And they talked about, I, I thought this was fascinating. They said, first of all, the two of them had a direct line. So they were talking all the time, which is not the case now between uh, different political leaders. And crucially, Tom Daschle mentioned that there was a, di a Senate dining room at the time, no longer there. It was got, they got rid of it maybe 10 years ago, which, you know, when, when things start getting really bad, <laughs> but um, they had this communal dining room that this only the senators were allowed to use. There were communal tables. So you sat with whoever you sat with and no aides were allowed in. So all these senators were, you know, forced to sit and have meals together. And so they would talk about, you know, they're lot, they wouldn't just talk about politics. They interacted with one another, not whereas, you know, now they only interact with one another by watching each other on the news or, you know, reading their tweets mm -hmm. or, you know, sort of this lobbying of vitriol back and forth. And it just whereas, reduces them to that. Exactly. But, you know, I think that's what a lot of people knew, now do is they, you know, do the signaling, you know, whether it's on Facebook or, you know, what the tweets are or they show who they're following. And so, so people don't get people get to know them by their signaling instead of sitting down with them. And, you know, once you find out someone loves their kids or they've struggled with an illness or they have elderly parents or, you know, they eat chocolate when they're nervous <laughs> or they, you know, or they love uh, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody and crank it up at a high volume to get themselves pumped up in the morning, you know, just little things like that. Once you know that about people, it's really hard to hold on to your hostilities. And once you sort of have that common ground, that's where you can reach compromise. Yeah, well, maybe I don't agree with you on this, but can we both agree on this? And can we move forward from here? And also, it's just real hard to demonize. You know, now it's like, 
if people don't agree, then the other person's just evil. Hmm. You know, they're evil for their beliefs. When, you know, their beliefs are where they come from. It's how they developed. And people are only, you know, only what they, they've experienced in the past. And to, you know, have that as your starting place that, you know, you're just stupid or you're, or you're just, you know, fundal, fundamentally corrupt or evil, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. And if you're saying or thinking about that, the other person, then you don't know them. You know a persona. You don't know the person. Yeah. When, when you were talking about, like, taking away the dining room and all of that, I was thinking of uh, Ginsburg and Scalia and how they were diametrically opposed, but they were really, really good friends as Supreme Court justices couldn't be more different politically, but they knew those little things about each other and were friends. And so then they compromised. And, and so I guess one of my questions too, is like, how is listening more than just like a, an altruistic or like a good thing to do to be a good person? How can it actually benefit us both biologically and help us be more successful in careers? Well, first, I want to say I, I love that you brought up uh, the Supreme Court because that has been the case with a lot of justices where they have had really wonderful friendships despite being on totally different ide- ideological levels. So you're so right to bring that up. Now, as far as, you know, listening benefits you just as much as it does the other person, if not more. Mm. Um, it, it isn't like, you know, a charitable thing. It really isn't because, you know, first of all, uh, listening helps you understand yourself just as much as the other person. Everybody knows that feeling of connection with another person when you really understand them or they really understand you when you're talking, when you're having that conversation that's like this wonderful dance, but you can almost feel it behind your solar plexus of just, you know, really getting lost in the narrative and really feeling like I I so get what this person's saying or this person so gets me. And one of the psychologists I interviewed who I quote in the book calls those moments snatches of magic. And we know what that feels like, or I hope most people do, you know, whether it's with a loved one, uh, you know, romantic partner, your child, a uh, parent, or even, you know, just that wonderful exchange that you might have with the checker at the grocery store, where you just, mm. you know, have that moment of, you know, where you get one another, where you have that connection. And Snatches of Magic is wonderfully poetic, but you talk to a neuroscientist And they can actually show you on fMRI scans of what's happening in the brain at that moment. And the brain of the listener and the speaker are actually the brain waves, the neural patterns actually sync up. They mirror one another. And in that moment, all of these feel-good chemicals are released in the body and it is just even evolutionarily, it's something that we all want. We all crave. It feels so good because it contributes to our survival. It's how we cooperate. It's how we learn. It's how we bond. It's, you know, how we got together to hunt that woolly mammoth. You know, you run over here and I'll run over here and also put up someone on the moon. And, you know, and and actually that's what's happening every day with the coronavirus. I know that there are bench scientists and there are people, you know, saying, okay, what if we did this? Hmm. I think it behaves this way. Now, what did you find? What are you saying? What, how can we, you know, put all of our cumulative knowledge together so we can be safe and we can improve our survival? It's, it's something that, you know, biologically you, you know, feel good, but it's also contributes to our survival. And if you want to get down to just an individual level, you know, it, it boosts your immunity. You know, when loneliness contributes, you know, that not lack of listening, not feeling connected to one another, and you cannot have a secure or attached relationship without listening to the other person. It's, it's impossible. And lack of listening leads to loneliness. And, you know, if you're lonely, that increases your risk of death as much as obesity and alcoholism combined. Wow. It's linked to all of these, you know, immune disorders. You um, have poor outcomes. The risk of death is increased just, you know, astronomically. It's, it's staggering. 
You know, before there was a coronavirus pandemic, there was a loneliness epidemic. And so it really is, it's, it's an imperative. That's why, you know, that is why I wrote the book, you know, and, and took the time off from journalism because I missed it a lot while I was writing the book. But because I, I mean, I really honestly believe that this is something that's really harming us and people don't know that they're not listening. That, you know, they've just been brought up in this culture where listening is taken for granted. They don't know how to listen. And um, so I really hope and I'm so grateful for you all for having me on the show to help get the word out because it really is. It's so important. It's something that we take for granted. And it's just essential to all of us as individuals and as a society. So. In this era of social distancing, uh, is it possible to have those snatches of magic over the internet? You know, it's harder. It it definitely is harder. But uh, I find, and and talking to people, just you know, as people are confined to their homes, you know, that they actually are. First of all, you know, part of it's positive because, because people are really realizing, oh, I really want to hear another person's voice. I, you know, I really want to be with another person. I don't want to be limited to just my devices. And people are really starting to realize how that doesn't quite do it for them. You know, I've, I've heard from a lot of people that they've noticed that they, you know, are calling people now, whereas before, you know, people just text me, you know, don't call me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) not going to answer my phone, where people are really going back to the phone to hear that voice, to have that resonance, you know, within their, you know, very bones. It's very different than getting an emoji to hear someone's voice. And so people are talking on the phone. And so, you know, it's, it's not the same as being able to see someone. But, you know, video conferencing, I really, you know, I, I don't discourage that. But, you know, I almost think it's better just to talk to someone on the phone because the video conferencing, people look weird. Mm. <laughs> they just they just do. They look weird. And also there's that little bit of a delay. Yeah. And the pixelation is such. And, and, and then, of course, you know, we all have to admit that, you know, the people are looking at themselves. They're not looking at you. They're looking at their own image on the screen to see how they look during the conversation. And so it brings in this whole nother level of distraction. And also it sort of upsets our, you know, our subconscious, you know, because we really, as these social animals that we are, we're always looking for those cues, those facial cues. We're, you know, trying to mirror one another. And when they're distorted like that, it's sort of upsetting. And, and even though we're not quite conscious of it, it's, it's really not doing the same thing. So you're almost better off just paying attention to those, you know, tonal shifts and to let people describe, you know, don't, you know, don't show me what you're making for dinner. Describe it for me. And why did you choose that recipe? It's your grandmother's recipe. Tell me about your grandmother. Did you make it with her? You know, those kinds of things where you can really get the, you know, blossom into this connection. And like you say, snatches of magic with, you know, describe it for me. Don't show me, tell me. So you learned to listen, I'm sure, over your vast experience as a journalist and all of these things. How can we get better at teaching these things in school to our students so that they, you know, get the experience um, and can grow into better listeners? You know, I, that's a really great question. I that would be one. I mean, first of all, I kind of, I would like to have my book be like a curriculum that's like put into schools. Cause I, I would love for kids to really realize, you know, that this is, this is as important as talking. Mm. And, you know, from the time they start in school, you know, they're really, they're really conditioned that there are all these courses and debate and rhetoric and, you know, giving speeches, you know, even, you know, young children, they have these speech competitions and, really there's there's nothing that teaches how to listen or how to value it and you know from the time we're really little you know the only time we hear listen it's almost in a negative context you know when your parents say listen to me mm-hmm. that you're not going to like what's happening <laughs> next you know the the just the word listen gets a negative listen up mm-hmm. it, not, nothing good is coming after that yeah 
you know, it's some rules or tell you to stop doing something or, um, or that you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even as you get older, you know, if your spouse or something says, listen, we need to talk, (laughs) (laughs) you know, that's not, so, you know, I think it really, part of it is to put more of a positive uh, connotation out of it. Like listening is this grand adventure. You know, what are we going to learn now? You know, if we listen, what what are we going to find out? You know, and really making more of a sense that, okay, we're the detective. And when this person's talking, you know, what are we finding out? What are we finding out new about this person? How is that person feeling right now? How does that person feel about what you said? How did their tone of voice change? You know, I mean, things like that. He ma- he made a mention of, you know, that earlier this morning he was running late. Maybe we should ask him why were you late? You know, what and that starts another story. It's kind of like opening the presents, you know, and there's, there's open that box and then there's a present in there and then you open another box and another box and another box. But, you know, kids naturally are great listeners. It just gets beaten out of them. You know, if you if you look at a toddler before a toddler's even gone to school, toddlers are going to listen to everything you say and repeat it back. Mm-hmm. And especially the things you don't want them to. They have just heard everything and they will ask you lots of questions. They want to find out everything. But when you get in school to sort of discourage that questioning and discourage that, no, you need to be quiet now. We need to focus. You know, it's it it does get beat out of children so i th- i think there's a space for talking about okay how can we encourage better listening and this is what listening is and also i want to listen to you let me model good listening tell me more about that i'm listening to you well so could you model a little good listening for us so I, what kind of things are you doing as you're listening to someone are you nodding your head? Are you uh, like giving verbal? Mm-hmm? Are you are you paraphrasing? Or how, how do you listen? Well, you know, I, it's really not a checklist of do's and don'ts. It's kind of like, um, you know, if you were to ask a baseball player, you know, how'd you hit that fastball? You know, yeah. they're gonna look at you like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I saw, yeah, you know, they've put in their 10,000 hours, so they know when to make that swing. You know, they've done it so much that they can no longer break it or and, and can anybody really break it down? But really, you know, I'm I think everybody listens in a different way. And also the circumstances change because, you know, sometimes, you know, saying mm-hmm or nodding is not what's called for. In, in the situation, it's, you know, every conversation is different. So it's really mostly a matter of losing yourself in it. You know, you don't have to act like you're paying attention if you actually are. Whoa. You know, you don't have to, you know, it's, and, and this, it isn't hard. It's just doing it. It's just kind of committing like what, I really think, it, you know, to start, if somebody really thinks they're not that great a listener is just sort of make the commitment when they enter a conversation, what am I going to learn about this person? And then also ask themselves, you know, how did that person feel about what we were talking about? If you kind of can answer those two questions when you get out of a conversation, then you're on your way. And with each conversation, you'll get better and better. The more people you listen to, the more aspects of humanity you'll recognize and the better your gut instinct will be. You'll know when to swing to hit the ball. You'll know exactly where the seams are as that ball comes hurtling towards you and know exactly when to make contact. Wow. You don't have to act like you're listening if you are is probably one of the best lines that's ever been said on this podcast. I love that. (laughs) And that's so true because sometimes I'm like, oh, how do I how do I make sure this person knows I'm listening? If I'm actually listening, I don't have to do that. Like that is, that's amazing advice. You know, I, I think the thing is, is none of this is hard. I think people get so worried that there's a right way or there's a wrong way to do things, or there's a right response or a wrong response. You know, that really gets in the way of listening as well. And there really is no right or wrong way. Each conversation, each person is different. So if you just have that curiosity of what can I learn 
And, you know, and some conversations are going to go better than others. You know, you're going to, you know, some people are more forthcoming. At, but, you know, the part of it is, is that, you know, just to be patient, you know, maybe the next conversation, but just to kind of have that presence and be, you know, welcome and open to it. I'm interested in you. I love those questions too. I, I don't know that I walk away from a lot of conversations knowing how the other person felt about it or asking myself how the other person felt about it when I leave. I think that is such a cool way to test our own you know, attention and understanding and how much we're paying attention to other people. And another thing that you iterate in the book a number of times is that bad listeners aren't bad people. And even if somebody isn't listening well to me, you know, that they're not a bad person inherently and that maybe, you know, I, so how do we, how do you respond to people in your life who, especially now in this time of, you know, isolation with your family and, you know, staying at home, being with the same people all day, how do you have patience for people that aren't listening to you and how do you help them be better listeners? I, I really think that um, the best way to get someone to listen to you is to listen to them. You know, the the more that you really can focus on the other person, you'll know where they are at that moment. You know what their tender points are. You know what's important to them, what their motivations are. So when it is your turn to talk, you know how to craft a message that really resonates, that really hits home because you know how to approach it. And that's how you can really get someone to listen to you. The most effective speakers are people that have listened well and often to their audience. They know their audience. So they know how to speak to them. Um, I also think that, you know, you really have to respect whether or not someone is receptive at that moment to that's part of being a good listener is picking up those cues and realizing this maybe isn't the right time. And, you know, maybe if somebody's overloaded at the moment, are they really stressed? Are they just, you know, can't talk about your stress, <laughs> you know, on top of theirs and they've been, you know, listening to too many death counts on the radio or, you know, tweets about it or whatever they're following online, you know, maybe they just can't take anything else in at the moment. And so that is is part of being a good listener is knowing what not only when you've heard enough, but maybe the other person's heard enough and it's time to retreat to your separate corners. Well, I, I'm sure I speak for all of the listeners of our podcast who say they could listen to you all day. Um, but we know we're hitting that time. So we will let you run on this. Where can our listeners go to learn more from and with you? Well, uh, you know, I contribute to the time. So, you know, I guess they can see what I'm doing there, but really just read the book. You know, there really isn't anything else. I'm, I'm not, I'm a bit allergic to social media for many of the <laughs> issues that we've already yeah. been talking about. But yeah, I, I think, you know, that they, they want to know how to listen better than definitely read the book. <sighs> Yep, I'd second that. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much for taking the time, Kate, really. I, and I, I even during this crazy time, and, you know, I, I really, really appreciate it. Okay, let's close up shop. Becky, what were some of your favorite things from this interview or her book? Well, I don't know. I, I've been thinking a lot about like the attention economy where focus is the new IQ. And we've been talking about that with other guests. But how much attention you're giving to a conversation really sends a message. And I think we all know that in our heart of hearts, but we still do things that undermine it, like checking our phone while someone's talking to us or playing games while we're supposed to be listening to a webinar. And it's just, it's fascinating to me. I'm so guilty of all these things, but how much I'm actually dividing my own attention and therefore undermining my own opportunities to learn about someone or something. Um, and in the book, she, Kate Murphy actually cited research that we only hear or attend to about half of what was said in a conversation. And that's right after we walk away from it. I mean, imagine a half an hour later, how much of a conversation you remember. And I just think there's a ton of gold in this book. And I really think everybody should read it. Um, I actually listened to it. It was a free download. If you're an educator, you can get free downloads from Libro FM. I know we've talked about this on the show before, but I'll link it in show notes again with instructions. Um, 
Last takeaway, there's a chapter in the book that I listened to three times on repeat because I just wanted to absorb all of it uh, about how listening to people with differing opinions from your own is the neurological equivalent to being chased by a bear. We are so threatened when we're presented with the opportunity to open ourselves to a different point of view. And we I just think we all need to get so much better about listening to people who, who we see as different from us if we want to get anywhere positive as a society. How about you, Ben? Yeah, ditto to all of those points, absolutely. But I think my biggest takeaway from her book and from and talking to her is that listening goes beyond just being a good person, that it actually helps you be more successful in any venture in life. Definitely true of teaching, uh, but in entrepreneurship or anything else as well, in, in your marriage, in your relationships with your friends. Uh, I loved the story she told in her book about a focus group for in the 1950s, and they were trying to study why Betty Crocker kick mixes weren't selling better. Um, and what they found when they actually listened, they're like, hey, how this tastes delicious. This is easy to do. These should be selling literally like hotcakes, uh, but they weren't. And so what they found when they actually listened to the end user was that it was actually too easy. And that deep down, we all have this desire to want to strive and work hard for the people that we love. And so by doing it and making it too easy, people didn't feel like they were working hard for the people that they loved. And so what they ended up doing is there were powdered eggs in it before. They took out the powdered eggs and said, you have to add your own eggs. And so it actually made people do more work uh, tasted the exact same, but what they found was that really we want to work hard for the people we love, and they only found that out by listening to the end user. So fascinating. Yeah, what are we not getting when we're not listening to people? So I think that's definitely my big takeaway. My favorite thing is uh, I don't want to listen as in wait for my turn to talk or listen for my opening, I actually want to listen to people. So that's definitely, yeah, my biggest takeaway. Listeners of Rainwaves, you're already the best listeners in the planet. We hope this episode helps you listen to the people you love and your students even better. And we want to listen to you. How can we help make this show better for you? Will you reach out to us at brainwaves.com and you can leave us a some feedback there, how we can make the show better for you. But as always, have a great, have a great generic time of day. Generic time of day.